Um, are you ready, Balash? I'm ready. Sure. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just to remind everybody that you're you're currently muted. If you'd like to ask a question, then you'll have to uh, unmute yourself, and you're also welcome to use the uh, chat um, either in Zoom uh, or if um, uh, if you're on YouTube and send something. Oh, someone monitoring the YouTube. Sorry, is that uh, can somebody do that? Okay, so. Um, I, we're very pleased to have uh, Balaj Sendroy, who's going to tell us about global aspects of Calabiao moduli space. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Jason and uh, Robert, for the invitation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I should start by saying that uh, this is entirely a review talk. I'm not uh, going to explain any new results. I unfortunately don't have any new results in this subject, but I uh, I was asked to to review uh, global aspects of the moduli and, and period theory of, um, of Calabi-Yau manifolds in higher dimensions. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so let me just um, start by a few standard recollections, and there'll be some repetition compared to talks that are in particular Claire gave, but I thought I'd need to summarize everything. So the first few slides I'm going to go through quite fast, but please uh, do uh, slow me down. And then there'll be plenty of examples in the second half of the talk. So that's really the main main focus of, of my talk. So um, I will just start with sort of the holonomy point of view. I mean, one other disclaimer, I'm an algebraic geometer. And so this is, my talk will be very much um, in algebraic geometry, but I'll, I'll emphasize all the connections to kind of the, the sort of language that perhaps is more familiar to, to this audience. So um, let's start from the holonomy point of view. So um, X uh, will always denote uh, a compact, complex, connected manifold of some dimension. Um, it will certainly be a Kähler manifold. So then just for, for a Kähler manifold, the holonomies, of course, are contained in N. And then there's this very standard um, fact or theorem that um, the following conditions are equivalent for this scalar manifold that, that the holonomy is contained in SUN, that there should be an overvanishing uh, holomorphic top form, and that the canonical bundle uh, should be trivial. Of course, two and three are really just free statements and are equivalent um, to uh, the holonomy being contained in, in SUN. So, and the special case that, that I'll look at is, is when the holonomy is, is exactly SUN. So that's, that will be um, the case of interest in this talk. Um, so just um, another basic fact, a um, couple of facts. So if you have exactly SUN, then this gives us these very strong uh, vanishing conditions. So there are no p-forms, no global p-forms, holomorphic p-forms uh, in sort of intermediate degrees between zero and n. Of course, there is a top form as well as of course uh, for p equals zero. This is non-zero, but in the intermediate ranges, we get uh, vanishing of, of all these um, global uh, spaces of sections. And uh, there's a, a not too difficult argument to show that the fundamental group of X is, is a finite group. I don't want to assume just simply connected uh, because some of the interesting, a couple of interesting examples will indeed have finite fundamental group. And I'll, I'll come back to this point later in the talk. But we know, certainly know this much. Um, and then of course, a, a basic result in this subject, which uh, you all know is, is, is yeah, theorem and Calabi conjecture. A particular case of the Calabi conjecture is that in this case, so when Kx is trivial and we take a Kähler class, so which uh, we take a class in the second cohomology, which we know is um, a Kähler form corresponding to, uh, which is, is a class of a form corresponding to some Kähler metric, then in fact there is a unique um, Ricci flat uh, Kähler metric um, uh, with the same um, cohomology class. So this will not, not play a big role for me, but whenever we're talking about sort of moduli spaces of these objects, we could also be thinking about a uh, space of Ricci fat metrics. Um, so the first interesting case is n equals two, um, the case of K3 surfaces. Of course, uh, that was covered in several talks already. Um, and it's also a rather different flavor. And we'll uh, see presently um, what, how different uh, that case is. Uh, but for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that I'm talking about a complex, com um, compact complex connected manifold admitting a, a metric with holonomy SUN, which we may as well take to be a Ricci flat if we want, and the dimension is, is bigger than two. 
So this will be my collabial. This will be a collabial unfold for me. Uh, Balash, then, Dominic just wanted to point out that uh, if X has harmony S-U-N for N even, then X is simply connected. That's correct. Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, my statement is still true. Uh, so about one proposition, which is a key proposition for the rest of the theory, and which is what makes this very different from the K3 case or, or hyperkähler or other cases, is that a collabial unfold with this definition is automatically projective as soon as n is larger than two. Um, and the proof is not very difficult. Um, so I'll, I'll come to Hodge theory a little bit later, but let's just note that with the conditions, um, every um, two form is, is in fact of, of type one, one. Um, and that means that near a Kähler form, there's always a rational Kähler form. So really moving uh, in the space of forms um, doesn't, cannot take us out of being of type one, one. Um, so if we have a Kähler form, um, then we'll find a rational Kähler form. And then an integral multiple of such a form is, is an integral Kähler form, and that must come from a projective embedding by Kodaira's embedding theorem. So this is really the, the, the key fact which makes this, this subject quite algebraic, that here we are talking automatically talking about projective varieties, compact complex manifolds or Kähler manifolds, which are automatically projective varieties. And that's special for n greater than two. Of course, this statement is false for um, K3 surfaces. So this, this fact makes this subject very different and quite strongly algebraic. Well, this is one of the facts that makes this quite strongly uh, of algebraic nature. Um, so uh, deformation theory, this is something that, that, that featured in um, class talk again, uh, the, the recorded talk. So I'll just uh, uh, go through this quickly. So what's the deformation of X? It's, uh, it's a proper whole in complex manifolds or maybe definitely one and uh, I want uh, for a fixed close point in B, I want the fiber to be my, my X. And then um, a basic uh, theorem uh, in this subject is that the Calabial unfold has very uh, nice local deformation space. So it has unobstructed deformations. There's a universal deformation or universal deformation germ um, uh, where the base P tilde is just a polydisc inside this um, finite dimensional complex uh, vector space with, a, uh, with the marked point, with the origin. And then there's a very nice family um, over that base. So the existence of the universal deformation is, is not so surprising because that depends on the vanishing of basically the lack of, of um, holomorphic um, vector fields. Um, and this isomorphism here uh, is of course true because the canonical uh, bundle is trivial. That's the top fetch power of uh, the cotangent bundle. Um, so that's not so surprising. And then Kodaira Spencer theory gives a, a universal deformation uh, where Biotilde does sit um, as a subspace of uh, uh, H1 Tx. So uh, there's a sort of convergence issues which, which can be can be solved here. So you, we can really think of this Biotilde as a germ or even as a as a as a small piece of a of a complex subspace. But what is surprising this to be a disk under a vanishing condition, um, which doesn't hold here. So H2 of the tangent bundle is not necessarily zero. In fact, in, in, very, in most interesting cases, it's non-zero. Um, and that should normally mean that, that this deformation is obstructed, that there are some equations describing um, B tilde inside H1. But in fact, all the obstructions vanish here, and that's a non-trivial fact. So there were um, some proofs of this fact. The original proofs were complex analytic. Um, then there are several algebraic proofs. Um, so the original proofs were due to Bogomolov, uh, Kian Todorov, and they, they used something called the DD bar lemma, so um, complex analysis. Um, algebraic proofs um, add into a uh, formal state from theory um, varieties. Um, names here are um, Kavamata, Manetti, um, uh, Gross, various people have, have worked on this. Um, I wanted to uh, mention one proof of this fact, which is most in the spirit of perhaps uh, uh, of interest to, to this audience, which is that there's a very nice paper of Ryushi Goto from 2004, which proved this statement uniformly for compact manifolds with special holonomy. So, um, 
that applies also to G2 and SPIN7. So there's a kind of uniform proof. It's a very, very nice approach, um, which proves unobstructedness for Calabiao and other special, special holonomy compact manifolds in a fairly uniform way. Um, so the next topic I wanted to discuss is the topology and, and Hoge decomposition. So I'm going to denote by H star XZ, the integral cohomology modulo torsion. Um, so torsion phenomena are not without interest. So I already mentioned pi one, there can also be torsion in uh, H3, which is of interest, but I won't uh, mention that uh, in this talk. So if um, we just take integral cohomology with no torsion, tensor with C, then we get the Hodge decomposition um, with HPQ being um, the Q homology holomorphic P forms. So uh, the reasons for this decomposition are also explained uh, very clearly in Claire's um, online talk. Um, so we'll assume X connected. So H0 is uh, just integers, H1 is zero. So that comes from the vanishing of um, sections of one forms together with the Hodge symmetry. Sorry, I, I didn't mention this. So there's, there's also, but well, that's quite well known is that there's also a, a symmetry between HPQ and HQP. So um, we have H1 XZ um, vanishing and then we have trivial Hodge decomposition in, in degree two. So that already played a role before. So H1 of H2. Um, so there's other bits in cohomology in between, but I'm talking about n folds here. Most interesting is the Hodge decomposition of middle cohomology. So that splits up into pieces that we sort of recognize. Here is sections of the canonical bundle as dimensional. Also dually, this is also one dimensional. Now H1x omega to the n minus one, that's isomorphic to H1x tx. So that's the base of the deformation space. And then there are the bits in between. So this is interesting partly because some of these have very clear geometric meaning. Also it's the richest uh, cohomology there is. Um, and then a lot of my talk, n will be three. So that's really then the only non-trivial uh, bit of information there is, is, is the whole decomposition on, on, on third uh, cohomology. And um, this is polarized. So uh, there was a discussion at the end of class talk and, and polarized will mean slightly different things in this talk as well. So the first, this, um, this is one use of the, uh, of the word polarization here, the polarization um, by the intersection form. So the intersection form gives a, a, a symmetric or skew symmetric form on, on middle cohomology, and that form plays a very important role. That was an interesting discussion at the end of class talk, and I'm very much going to use that, um, that intersection form um, as part of the data. Um, I'm sort of slightly lying here. If n is greater than three, then you really want to take what's called primitive cohomology. Um, but let me not go into, into that. That's a small modification of this, this data. Um, for n equals three, the total, uh, all of the cohomology is primitive. Um, there's no difference in any case. Um, so what's interesting is really what's happening uh, to the Hodge decomposition in, in families. Um, so, um, let me discuss um, that. So first, uh, let's uh, start with deformations of a rather small basis. So here I'm going to take a contractible base, something like a polydisc uh, of um, the deformation of its, of its central fiber. So it's got some other fibers. And because um, the uh, base is contractible, we can sort of trivialize the cohomology um, uniformly. So by Erasmus vibration theorem, we have a topologically trivial family and we can trivialize in a canonical way, we can trivialize um, the um, integral cohomology in the fibers. So um, if you want, you could you could say gauss monin connection here, but that won't play a, a big role for me. So I'll just stay informal and say, let's trivialize the integral cohomology using a, um, a, a trivialization of the family topologically. And then, so you see that the Betty numbers um, are, are constant in the family. And in fact, also the Hodge numbers are constant. So that's because their sum is constant and also because you have semi-continuity. So the Hodge numbers could, um, could only jump up, but they don't jump up because they can't. Um, but so these numbers are constant, but the Hodge decomposition, or if you want um, these subspaces, so P, K, H, P, K minus P of the fiber varies inside the cohomology. And in fact, varies non-holomorphically. So um, this variation of, of the piece, piece of, of the, co the cohomology inside um, the non-varying cohomology space, that's non-holomorphic. 
but it's just one of uh, Griffith's major insights in the subject. If you instead uh, consider filtration um, by uh, kind of, uh, it's a filtration cohomology given by the Horsley decomposition, then you get something which actually does vary holomorphically with the base. So um, instead of um, a decomposition, a direct sum decomposition, we should look at a filtration, and then that filtration really does, does vary holomorphically. And in fact, not only discovered a very strong constraint on how this, this varies, so again, this is uh, familiar from uh, Claire's talk, um, and that, that this variation satisfies this, this property that if I differentiate um, variation in the Hodge filtration, um, so it, it won't necessarily, so, so classes here will not necessarily stay in FP, but it can only jump up to FP minus one. So um, the, the variation has this kind of constraint that you can't jump about arbitrarily, uh, you can only kind of jump up one step. And this is a, this is a key property of this setup. So this is uh, completely general. There's nothing uh, particularly Calabiaish so far. Um, so, uh, and then you, we can translate that into um, this sort of piece of linear algebra that we can consider and then a corresponding uh, space called the period domain is we can look at middle cohomology. We'll keep the integral cohomology together with its uh, polarization. That's, a, that's the form. Symmetric D to be the space parametrizing all in this cohomology vector space satisfying um, the following conditions. So we want um, the dimension of each piece um, in that flag to be the, the fixed dimension, the dimension of the case piece of the space uh, X. And then there is an orthogonality condition, which if you translate into this language becomes uh, this fact that FK and F and minus K plus one should be um, kind of orthogonal with respect to this form. And then there are certain positivity properties with respect to the, to the product. Let me not write it down. So this is roughly sort of Hodge Riemann bilinear relation type um, inequalities. So what's the setup here? So the period domain D is therefore going to be an analytic open subset. So these are inequalities uh, of what's called a compact dual uh, D bar, which is a projective variety of all flags satisfying one and two. So one and two are purely algebraic conditions. So this is basically telling us that we are in a certain partial frag variety. And then uh, there are some quadratic uh, equations on this um, on this flag variety. So these are purely algebraic conditions, and then we have this complex analytic uh, inequalities um, given by um, given by these extra positivity or inequalities. So um, how do you put the two together? So um, if you if you have a deformation uh, over some small brace, so once again I assume that the B is sufficiently small, contractible, um, and I can. That means that I can fix an isomorphism. So I explain this for cohomology, but that will, of course, also respect um, the intersection form. Um, and then, if you look at how the Hodge filtration varies in middle cohomology, then that gives rise to uh, um, to the local period map. So the local period map is a map of the base to D on what I'm taking here is is middle cohomology. And now this is um, the first statement, which certainly requires conditions. So here I'm very much going to use the fact that I'm, um, I'm using, uh, I'm talking about uh, families of Calabiaos. So for the universal deformation, um, or in fact, any therefore any subspace of that, if I take the local period map, that's a complex analytic embedding. So in other words, um, locally near um, some fixed Calabia unfold, I can recover, um, its deformations um, from uh, the data of um, the Hodge structure, polarized Hodge structure, so the Hodge filtration together um, and the intersection form. So um, this is a very nice, nice result. Again, uh, there's a simple proof in, in Claire's lecture, so I, I won't write it again, but I do want to draw your attention back to this paper of, of, of Goto, who doesn't quite use this map because he doesn't quite have the whole setup um, in his context, but something which in the Calabria context will turn out to be uh, carrying equivalent information. And he gives a uniform proof um, for compact manifolds with special holonomy, also of, of this result. So both unobstructedness and infinitesimal uh, Torelli 
get proved in, in this paper uniformly um, for, um, for all compact manifolds uh, carrying special holonomy metrics. Uh, the last um, very important result I want to mention, um, partly because one of the authors is in the audience, but also because it's, it's extremely important in the subject, is this uh, theorem of, of Bryant and Griffiths. And I won't uh, uh, introduce all the notation, but the, the philosophy or the, 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 even the precise statement, which I won't quite explain, will be very important for us. Uh, let me just sort of summarize it in this way, that the image of any period map for a Calabial I guess they wrote threefold, but there is a generalization to all Calabria n folds, is that it's contained in, in a horizontal submanifold of the period domain. So I won't define horizontal. Um, um, a complex analytic notion or a differential notion that it's an integral manifold in differential system. And the differential system comes from the Griffith's transversality. So I guess that paper in, for, for Calabria threefolds is beautiful because you can sort of pin this down quite precisely what this differential system is and and but, but the message is that there's a very strong constraint constraint on on the image of any period map uh, in the Calabria context that they should be a horizontal submanifold uh, of these so once again let me emphasize that n is greater than two here and of course this is very very different um so speakers on k3 surfaces and holomorphic syntactic um manifolds um spent a lot of time explaining to us that uh, the period map is, is dominant or subjective in that context. Um, and this is very different. So here there is a very strong, um, in some sense, very explicit constraint on the image, but um, it's, uh, it's in general not, not so easy to handle. So I'll come back to this point um, a little later. So Bash, in, in, in Goto's um, statement, it's, it's now not presumably a complex analytic embedding. It is no complex. Uh, uh, Structure going around? Is it just some smooth embedding, or what's what's the? I refer you to the paper. So, so sure. sorry, I, I I can't remember exactly. He finds relation. I get that. I analytic embedding. That's right. But he finds a nice formulation. Where, but yes, you, you're right. You're right. No, no, I mean, it's it's fine. I'm not a great expert on this. I'm just a fan of this paper because it, it, sure. it looks like it's, it's a nice uniform treatment. And yes, I, yes, absolutely. So whatever is appropriate uh, in that context. And sorry, uh, uh, I didn't quite catch. Did you say something about the definition of this horizontal? I mean, you didn't define it. I don't want you to define it. But did you say uh, what it was about? Well, I mean, you just I mean, you basically need to uh, uh, need to translate Griffith's transversality. I mean, we have the expert expert here, so I, uh, I, I, not, not. I mean, off, off the top of my head, I, I, I can't really tell you anything more about it. No, that's fine. When you take Griffith's transversality, you translate it, you get a certain differential system, and you just want, uh, you know, it's it's basically you just you're describing it in a kind of foliation language that it's a leaf of a certain certain foliation. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great, great, thanks. Right, so I want to globalize this. That was my job. So I want to globalize this construction. So again, I'm going to repeat something that, that, that Claire explained, but I wanted to kind of write this quite precisely because the details are sort of important. So we want to define a version of the, of the period map globally. So we need to construct some global moduli space of Calabria and folds. So um, one version of this is, is what's called type Miller space. So this is how it begins. So we we'll fix a, a lattice, some lattice uh, with some form with, with the correct symmetry and, and signature properties. So Lambda is a finite rank Z module with, with some, some form on it. Um, and so a marked Calabria manifold is just a pair of a Calabria manifold where we fix an isomorphism between its, its middle cohomology and uh, with its form with this fixed thing. Um, and so we're going to consider triples of, so X L gamma where uh, we have a marked Calabria manifold and L a Kela class of an ample line bundle on X. So this was again, so this is another form of polarization. Um, locally, in fact, this is not restrictive at all. So if you have an ample class on the central fiber, uh, in this context, um, in the Calabria context, that will automatically extend to, a, to an ample class, so no nearby fibers as well. Having, having said that, and, and again, Claire explained this, to, to get a nice global space, you do uh, want to include um, 
the, uh, the data of a polarization, a data of an ample, of an ample line bundle. Um, I'll come back to this point a little bit later. Um, but let's just consider such triples up to isomorphism. And there's certainly a good notion of what's a nearby triple. So I won't write it down, but you can imagine that there's a very natural notion of, of what's a nearby triple. So it's certainly a topological space. So what I want to do is I want to take connected components of this topological space. And, and here's a fact that every connected component of, of the space of such triples has the structure of a connected and has those complex manifold. So where does this structure come from? It's, so this is, this is what's called the type Muller space or maybe a type Muller space of marked polarized Calabria landfold. So for me, T is going to be some connected space parametrizing precisely such triples. And where does the complex structure come from? Well, complex structure really comes from the fact that, which is uh, written here, is that if you fix a triple, um, then um, the local germ can be identified, or if you want, the local germ gets a complex structure from the universal deformation germ of XT. Uh, so be because, I mean, the main reason, as I said, is that um, over the uh, universal deformation germ, any polarization extends. So first of all, we have polarizations, we have ample classes, as I explained, and then you can just expand, uh, you can just extend them across the, uh, the, the universal deformation space. So, um, so there is a global um, global family, so you given by the universal deformation space, I can just pull back or, or uh, a global family of Calabria manifolds over the uh, over Teichmuller space. So in fact, um, so this is Teichmuller space is of course rather large um, uh, because it uh, encodes all these markings, uh, but it's a, it's a complex manifold and it carries uh, a universal family. Uh, universal Teichmuller, universal mark family. So that's certainly a natural way to come up with some sort of global space. So that's that's Teichmuller space. And Teichmuller space is built um, uh, to so that the period map is uh, defined on it. Um, so uh, if you fix a base point corresponding to a triple um, and then use the markings, then you can um, consistently um, identify the cohomology of the markings uh, with its polarization with the fixed lattice and then uh, with uh, again with our fiber and so that gives us really a, a global identification of uh, a trivialization really of of, uh, of all these um, middle cohomology spaces and so you can just define the global period map if trivialized you have the Hodge vibration uh, sorry the Hodge filtration everywhere and the Hodge filtration defines a global map to the corresponding uh, period domain. So that's a global period map. So phi is really defined. If you want, you can put together all the local ones defined on the uh, deformation spaces and that fits together to a global map and it's a global holomorphic map. And what do we know? We know that for Calabria and Falls, this holomorphic map is locally injective by infinitesimal Motorelli and its image lies in a horizontal submanifold. So let me just spend, uh, this is not really my main subject, but let me just uh, just spend a, a, a minute on, on some metric aspects. So the Aguilar space does carry a natural metric, the Wild Peterson metric, which can be defined using the Calabria metric or rich metric. It's very important here. So there are analogous metrics for the Muller space of elliptic curves, just the upper half plane, K3 surfaces, abelian varieties. Um, in these cases, this is a complete metric which tends to have negative curvature. So the situation here is quite different. Um, so for um, the y is a metric on on mirror space is incomplete. There are finite distance singularities. So I think it was first noticed in a paper of Candelas, Green, and Hübsch. Um, so this is around the time when Calabrias became very important in, in string theory. Um, again, it was noticed in a in a follow up paper. Well, this is was one of the most famous papers in the subject on, on, on mirror symmetry that a certain one dimensional type Muller space co that comes up there has um, a bit of uh, the Vipertus symmetric as a, a, somewhere in space, it um, tends to plus infinity. So there's no bound, um, upper bound on, on, on the curvature. Now there was a positive result um, that if the type Muller space is one dimensional, then as in, then near certain boundary points, the y is a metric is asymptotic to the Poincaré metric. So near certain boundary points, it does have negative curvature. 
Um, based on that, it was conjectured that the scalar curvature, at least of any YP trisometric on, on any type Miller space, should be non-positive near the boundary. But that's that's now known to be false as well. So um, Callum Wilson and the student uh, in 2011 showed that that's also false. So basically, this is this as far as its curvature properties go, this is not a very very nice metric. It's but you don't really get much out. So the different metric you can put on Teichmuller space, which is a, a kind of Hodge theoretic metric, which is a natural metric pulled back from from the period domain via phi. So D um, does does carry a kind of nice natural metric from Hodge theory, and this does have better curvature properties. So this is proved by by Lu and Son in 2004, and there's there's a there's a bit of literature on 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 this subject. So people have used um, metrics on Teichmuller space to um, to prove certain results, certain there's some certain, uh, some some volume results known that um, uh, the volume is computable in some cases. So um, it's this is not really going to be essential for the rest of the talk, but this is um, a corner of the subject where there are some some interesting results. Um, but it's more complicated than some of the standard cases. Okay, so I want to forget about the marking now. So this is. Uh, something that, that already featured in the previous talk. So we, we can also consider just polarized Calabrian manifolds. So XL up to isomorphism without marking. So this, this space also has uh, a natural topology. And what I want to do is I want uh, to look at a connected component, which is uh, which I'm going to denote M. And um, I call that the moduli space of uh, still polarized Calabrian manifolds. Polarized in the sense that we still keep the data of, uh, of the M power. Now, this is a space of um, quite different nature. So in fact, uh, very generally, so just the, the assumptions I made, um, this space M carries the structure of a quasi-projective algebraic variety. Uh, it's an orbifold, so it's going to have some uh, quotient singularities, um, but um, it's dot, it does have an algebraic structure. And you do very much use the existence of the polarization to prove this result. So this, is, um, this fits into a, a general uh, set of results proved by proved by Fierig. Um and uh, the main reference for this kind of thing is uh, is his big book. Um, so okay so we have a um, now again um, just as before if we if we look at some point in M and we look at the um, um, isomorphism class of the polarized Calabria manifolds that it represents, then its topological invariants are, are independent of T. So um, the argument is, is similar to before, but this is a slightly different space. It's a coarse moduli space. It itself does not have a family over it because when we take um, uh, the spaces up to isomorphism, then we will sometimes quotient with, uh, with some, some finite groups, but it turns out that over a finite cover of M, there is a family. So you can sort of save this just by a finite cover. You don't have to go all the way to Teichmuller space to find a, a nice family over, over a certain finite cover of M uh, is already a, a space. So this is a kind of technical thing, but it's, it's sometimes good to know. OK, so this is, of course, a, a basic and important object. Um, it's or really a functional moduli spaces. So for every um, fix an end, then there's going to be a, a large collection of um, of these moduli spaces. Um, and so one of the key questions is, and you could say one of the, the question in the subject, uh, in any fixed dimension, how many substantially different moduli spaces are exist? So what do I mean by substantially different? So here I do want to forget the polarization. So of course, if I take some space with some ample line bundle, then take the second power of that line bundle. According to my definitions, of course, they're not isomorphic. They give different polarized moduli spaces. So when I formulate this question, I want to very loosely forget about polarizations and really think about substantially different moduli spaces. So I'm going to take a subset of the previous set uh, where really um, I, I forget about the, moduli, uh, the, the polarization as well. Now, we don't know whether this number is finite. We don't know whether there are finitely or infinitely families of substantially different moduli spaces of Calabria and Foltz. Um, various people put conjectures, at least on whiteboards, sometimes even in papers, and the conjectures contradict each other. So there's a camp that thinks that this number should be finite, and there's an opposite camp that thinks that that, that number should be infinite. And I don't know. 
Um, even the weaker question of fixing some topological invariance, let's fix the topology, how many different moduli spaces exist? Is this number finite? Even that is not known. This is much more likely to, this, 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 much, this, this question is much more likely to have a positive answer, but I still have no idea. It's much harder to construct different families with the same topological invariance, but there are known constructions. So certainly you don't expect a connected family just fixing the topological invariance. Uh, and then there is a question which is sometimes called Reed's fantasy. After a paper uh, that Miles Reed wrote, he would for he formulate it this slightly differently, but in a slightly more um, contemporary approach, what we might ask is, are all Calabial and moduli spaces connected by what's called geometric transitions? So geometric transitions are certain operations like degenerations and resolutions, which can change the topology. Um, and one question is, can you perhaps connect up all of these moduli spaces um, by geometric transitions. We don't know. Certainly, we don't know any country example. It's the question is sufficiently loosely formulated that it seems hard to come up with a with a country example. This is what we know. Uh, so, ready for n equals three, at least tens of thousands of different moduli spaces are known. Um, that if that essentially means tens of thousands of different um, Betty numbers. Um, because as I said, within fixed Betty numbers, it's hard to tell when two manifolds are deformations of each other. But as I said, there are examples known of different families with the same data. So we certainly know that there are known deformation equivalent uh, Calabria threefolds with the same topology. And we don't even know bounds. I guess I should have, could have put that as a question. Are there any bounds on the topological invariance? We know some bounds under the assumption of extra structure. So, for example, I think we now know that for elliptic vibrations, bi is bounded. I'm not sure if we know effective bounds. Um, so, even this is very hard, bounding topological invariance. And I don't know any strong results. And we do know that at least many moduli spaces of interest, in, at least in the Calabria threefold context, can be connected by geometric transitions. Perhaps the most substantial analysis of this was done. Um, but one of those means in the geometric transitions. Um, if the new probably are manifest by geometric transitions, or so one is using this language a lot, um, and systematically also one can connect up many moduli spaces. Um, and related to this, I wanted to just 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 show you this slide as well. So what do we know, say, about Calabria oh, three folds, about their a, geography? So sorry, Bash, there's a question from yep. Miriam Svetich. Is, is finiteness of elliptically fibered Calabrias true for all n? Is this a statement for all dimensions or? I don't think so. Finiteness of families and even, so Mark Gross proved by irrational finiteness for Calabria three folds. Uh, even that's a slightly tricky statement. Uh, certainly, that proves that Betty numbers are finite. Betty numbers, there's a finite range of Betty numbers for elliptically fibered columnar are threefolds. But it's a hard result. It's a hard paper. Uh, I don't think this is known in higher dimensions. But Mark's paper is difficult. So, uh, and it does do a very explicit analysis of Tate Schaffer average groups over rational surfaces. So I don't know, but it is possible that it's, it's not known. It's also possible that it is known. Sorry, I, I can't remember, but it's, it, it certainly wouldn't be automatic from, what, from, from what's known from three folds. There is, there's no machine that you can just, I mean, there's a kind of machine, but, but, but there's work to do to prove such finiteness results. Um, of course, related to that is, is, is we don't know whether any Calabria is birational to something with an elliptic vibration. Um, sorry, I take that back. That, that, that so. We know that some, some Calabria are not birational to elliptic vibrations. You might conceivably imagine that, for example, Calabria is large enough Picard number are birational to elliptic vibrations, but I don't know that either. Um, so uh, basically very little is known of such kind of global overarching statement. Okay. Thank you. So here's a, here's a, what 
but geography, this is a kind of so um, sort of two topological numbers, which you could take to be B2 and B3. Sometimes people take H21 and H11. Uh, the most interesting plot is actually if you take one of the coordinates to be the Euler characteristic and the other one, sometimes called the height, is the sum of H11 and H21. And when you plot that, you get this kind of intriguing picture. So this has a lot of structure, and I won't talk much about this. Of course, historically, the fact that such a picture is symmetric uh, with respect to the vertical axis was extremely important, and that's mirror symmetry. So this particular plot completely symmetric, and that's a theorem because this is a plot of um, basically color bar three folds coming from reflexive polytopes, and we know from Butterab that that's a fully symmetric setup. An earlier picture of many fewer dots and not completely symmetric was famously one of the most strongest bits of evidence for mirror symmetry. Um, and there is also a meaning to the color here. So the color here is a kind of frequency. So it's not, we don't know that the color here relates to the number of actual families. The color here just comes from how often a certain pair of Hodge numbers comes up um, in among reflexive polytopes. Uh, uh, you might, some, some of you will know that there's 500 million reflexive polytopes and this picture has about 30,000 dots in it. So there's certainly going to be degeneracy and the degeneracy is, is plotted with a color. Um, and as I say, the color corresponds to how many toric families give you a certain Hodge number, which will probably cor correlate with the number of uh, families, but not exactly. Um, and there's the blue here is, is, is millions. So in the middle here, there are sort of any Hodge number here is realized by millions of toric families. As you would expect, there's going to be some heavy degeneracy. Okay, um, so back to kind of questions of periods and moduli. So to define the period map on the moduli space, we need to forget the marking. How do we forget the marking? To uh, take this group, I'll take the biggest possible group, which is the uh, automorphism group of this lattice. So this is a free Z module with a form. Now I'm going to take its automorphism group. So this is an arithmetic group and it's known to act properly and discontinuously on, on D. So this is a, Again, as, as, as Claire explained in the previous talk, this is, this is an important feature. I want to take a quotient of D by that group, and I, I can at least to get a, a reasonably nice, nice quotient. This D mod gamma does have a kind of analytic structure on it because of, of this fact. And we had the, the, um, the period map, which used the markings. If I forget the marking, then um, I can still define the period up to uh, indeterminacy by this group. That's basically what, um, uh, what the marking did is to fix exactly this degree of determinacy. I know that there is an isomorphism. The marking fixes an isomorphism. If I forget the marking, my period point is well defined after the group action. So this is this phi bar is going to be our period map on moduli space. And then this leads us to the global Torelli problem. So the global Torelli problem is a question whether this period map phi bar from M to D mod gamma is injective or some connected moduli space of Calabial manifolds, polarized Calabial manifolds. Um, and so once again, the big difference from, from K3 and other worlds is that uh, this is not, not surjective. So the global Torelli formulation is as equivalent to this following concrete formulation that if you, if you have polarized Calabi folds which live in the same deformation family, and you have an isomorphism between the middle cohomology respecting the Hodge filtrations, does it imply that um, uh, they are isomorphic? Uh, sorry, XY is should be X1 and X2. And then there are some variants. So we could ask for generic in injectivity, that's the global Torelli, or we could change the group to a different group acting discontinuously on D. So I've, I've taken the biggest group available, but um, monodromy groups will typically be smaller and, and still interesting groups. So you could take the smallest possible group that you need uh, to make this map well-defined. That's typically be a, a subgroup, sometimes uh, even quite substantially smaller than the, uh, than the whole gamma. And you might want to take a quotient with respect to that group and, and ask the same question. So let me sort of start giving examples. And of course, everybody's favorite example uh, which fits into the subject very well is quintic threefold. So uh, let's take a uh, degree five polynomial of five variables homogeneous in P4. Uh, they have trivial canonical bundle by the adjunction formula. They have Picard rank one, so H2 is, uh, is a rank one by left hat's hyperplane principle. Um, and then the middle cohomology really jumps up. Uh, of course, 
there's no H3 here, but there's a large H3 here of rank 204 with Hodge numbers one and one. So these are the ones that we already know. And then one. And it's very easy to explain here. So then, uh, uh, canonical so polarization here, I can just take our group. And then with that polarization, I get the moduli space Mx, which is a, a, a quotient um, by uh, PGL5C of some set U. So what's U? Uh, U is the open set of non-singular quintic polynomials up to scale. So I say I take the space of all quintic polynomials on P4. That's a certain 126 dimensional vector space. I projectivize it. I take an open subset of that. That's 125 dimensional. And then I just take that up to the obvious section of uh, the projective linear group. Uh, so that gives me 101 parameters and that's the 101 here. So all deformations of this uh, hypersurface are uh, deformations in the projective space because of um, uh, this fact that the polarization is canonical. On the other hand, the period domain is quite a bit bigger. Um, it parameterizes flags of this, this kind. So it parameterizes flags in a 204 dimensional vector space um, uh, with these pieces. So that's a lot of information. That's already the first piece is something like 203 dimensional and then there's some extra data if you want. So that's a much, much bigger space. So typically that's the situation. Your moduli space is much smaller um, than the space you're mapping into. So that's a lot of information. The question is how can you get, get that information out? So in this case, there's a theorem due to Claire um, which states that uh, quintic threefold satisfy at least weak global torality can be recovered from this period point. So that map uh, phi uh, bar from the moduli space to uh, the quotient period domain, that's generically injective, degree one. So uh, a very brief discussion of proof. So this goes back to Donaghy, 1983. So for projective hypersurfaces, the, uh, the host structure um, gives you a certain algebraic structure on the Jacobian ring of the hypersurface. So the Jacobian ring is just take all polynomials and, and divide by uh, derivatives of F. So a bunch of quartic polynomials in this case. So Donaghy and, and Donaghy too had, a, had a crystallized a trick, uh, which is called the symmetrizer lemma, which allows you to systematically recover the equation of the hypersurface from the Jacobian ring. It's a very nice package. It it's, works very beautifully but it doesn't work in Calabriar cases. In Calabriar cases, the symmetrized dilemma is essentially empty. And that was, of course, noted by Donaghy. Donaghy's theorem specifically excludes uh, Calabriar cases. So Claire sort of settled this question uh, some 20 years ago. She uh, uh, wrote a very beautiful paper, but it's, it's a large bag of very special tricks for the quintic threefold. And as I understand, she invented this when she couldn't do more serious maths because she had other concerns. Um, but then she didn't leave the situation um, in that state of set, uh, set state. She now has a much better paper a few months ago, a couple of months ago, where she gives a systematic, very algebraic treatment. So this is again using algebraic methods of weak, weak global Torelli for a large class of Calabial type hypersurfaces and other hypersurfaces where the previous methods didn't apply. Um, so this is a very recent and very beautiful uh, result of, of Claire's. So be as it may, we know that um, uh, we global Torelli does hold for quint threefolds. So we also know that the way I formulated we global Torelli, um, it can fail. So um, the starting point is sort of very similar, but then things change um, very soon. So um, I want to start with just a slightly different hypersurface, an optic hypersurface in this weighted projective space. So weighted projective space has some x variables of weight one and y variables of weight two. I want an optic in there. So that's going to be a Calabial because a junction works sort of a way it did before. Eight is one plus one plus two plus two plus two. So that's a junction says that y bar has a trivial canonical bundle, but this particular y bar is singular. Because of these weights, there are going to be some more before singularities. So to get a Calabial threefold, um, I need to take a resolution of singularities. In this case, just a single blow up. So I get just one more Kähler class. So B2 is two. Middle cohomology will turn out to be 174 dimensional. The moduli space has dimension 86. So this is a, a 2,86 model in the physics language, very well known to both mathematicians and physicists. But this was a, a, um, something I proved uh, in my thesis that um, the period map here is of degree at least two. 
if you take it on isomorphism classes of resolutions of sorry, isomorphism classes of deformations of resolutions of this space to the relevant period domain, and that going to be of the at least two. And what's what's relevant here is that if you uh, resolve the singularities of of um, this y bar then generic deformations of Y are actually not going to be resolutions of hypersurfaces. You kind of deform away from this hypersurface family. Uh, so you get a kind of richer geometry and in that richer geometry, uh, actually um, Robo Torelli fails in this, in this sense. Now these are weak country examples. So the, the three folds in the family with the same period point are birational, but not isomorphic. So this is an interesting feature that, that shows up. I mean, you could argue whether these are country examples or not, the way one formulates this statement is um, um, this, this period map is, is of degree two, but perhaps they, they, this is not the strongest possible way this, this, this statement can fail. Um, but um, there's, there's a little bit to prove here, which is uh, not so difficult. Um, let me go from very large moduli spaces, so dimension 86 or 100 or um, to the other extreme, so small moduli spaces. So, um, one extreme, uh, an absolute extreme, is, is when the moduli space is of dimension zero. So uh, when H3 is um, just two dimensional, so there's no um, H21, um, that's the case of rigid Calabi-L3 forms. That's a very interesting subject, but perhaps not so uh, interesting from uh, the point of view of the present discussion. So let's focus on, on some one dimensional moduli spaces. Um, so the best known um, example is the quintic mirror or mirror quintic. So you start with the quintic, say the Fermat quintic, you take a certain quotient of it, and then you take a certain, uh, you take a resolution. So this uh, quintic mirror has a one dimensional moduli space. The moduli space is essentially um, uh, a sphere with two points removed, and then there's a special orbit four point uh, of order five. So that's a, that's a kind of very nice, and of course, extremely uh, richly studied moduli space, but in particular, in a 2008 paper, Usui wrote down uh, the theorem, which I guess everybody expected to be true, is that this does satisfy weak global Torelli. So the period map from this uh, puncture P1 to the period domain is generically injective. However, again, you can sort of change this family a little bit. Um, a slightly different group, again, 125, order 125, that's the same order here, but a slightly different structure. So this one, is not just a diagonal group, but there's a kind of um, permutation part to it. So this is a, a semi-direct product. Um, this particular uh, group was studied by Espinosa and Morrison, again, in a string theoretic context. So once again, you take the quintic, you take a, a quotient, and then you resolve. So interestingly, and that was one of the reasons why Espinosa and Morrison were interested in this example, they manufactured this to have a finite fundamental group and still a one-dimensional moduli space. So B21 is one here, so H21 is one here, um, but there is a fundamental group. So I studied, again, this, 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 this family, um, and what I, what I proved here, again, a long time ago, is that the period map is of degree five. So once again, all I could prove is that there is location in the period map you have to take a slightly different um, from gamma uh, to uh, the because of the fundamental some issue about some um, uh, sort of finite some, some finite map and and uh, and in particular there's a, a very natural isomorphism of cohomology with um, coefficients value invert five. If you don't invert five, then there's, there's, there's some discussion. But, but the result of this nature is, is, is certainly true that there's a well defined period map, which, which is of degree five, at least uh, from this one dimensional period, one dimensional moduli space. So I conjectured back then, and it's still unresolved, whether these, these Calabi R3 folds are birational. I don't think they are. So this is a stronger counterexample. And I think they have non equivalent derived categories. Um, this is unknown, and there may be interesting questions uh, around this family which are unresolved, in partly also to do with the role of the fundamental group here. Um, so let me in the last uh, few minutes come back to some global considerations. Um, so uh, we have this startup, but so quite a lot of algebraicity. So we have uh, Dijk-Müller space, that's very large. 
But then we have the database, which is much smaller, a domain, which is an open subset of, uh, of an algebraic variety, a projective variety of, of, of flags. So this is algebraic. Uh, M is, is a quasi-projective orbifold. And we have this map phi here with locally injected. And then its image is constrained to line horizontal submanifold by Griffith's transversality. So that's kind of the setup. Um, but um, it appears that in most cases, these maps are really too transcendental. Um, so perhaps Griffiths's hope was that in um, substantial examples of this nature, uh, these maps can be used really to describe some aspect of moduli space. Very widely successful for, for, for K3 and hyperkähler and, and really not so successful here, precisely because of this point. But some cases this works. So let me just explain um, this relatively recent um, set of uh, some, some examples and, and approach, which says that in some cases, this, this uh, uh, picture is more algebraic than meets the eye. And again, I refer you back also to the discussion in the last uh, five, 10 minutes of, of Claire's talk. Uh, let me just make this a, a bit formal. So is the definition a closed horizontal submanifold um, it's called semi-algebraic. If it's a connected component of an intersection, um, Z bar intersection D, where Z bar is a Zariski closed sub variety of D bar. So D bar is algebraic. It does have notion of Zariski closed sub varieties, of course. If I intersect it with this um, uh, analytic open subset, I get something which is reasonable. It's reasonable to call semi-algebraic. Now there's a very beautiful result, a uh, relatively recent result of Friedman and Loza. Um, which, um, which proves a very strong result about, the, about um, such situations and also gives a partial classification. So let me just state that, that starting result. So let's assume that we have a closed horizontal subvariety. Um, with We have gamma, the um, arithmetic monodromic group, and we look at the stabilizer subgroup that fixes Z and assume that Z in D is semi-algebraic. So that's this assumption. And also assume that Z mod gamma Z is quasi-projective. So uh, because of our previous discussion of, of M being quasi-projective, that's a reasonable assumption. Let's make these two assumptions. And then the conclusion that Z is a very nice emission symmetric domain. It's embedding into D is an equivariant, so gamma Z equivariant. So this is a kind of very strong statement. So if D itself is Hermitian symmetric, then we're talking essentially about Shimura type embeddings. D itself doesn't have to be Hermitian symmetric, but Z is, um, and the embedding is sort of as nice as, as you could expect. So this is a kind of theoretical result, and then they give lots of examples. So let me just sort of summarize this in, in that picture. So we have Z, uh, indeed, that's semi-algebraic and horizontal, and then this quotient here is quasi-projective and maps into D mod gamma because this map was equivariant. So the message is that the image of the period map could sometimes be described explicitly in geometric terms, perhaps an interesting conclusion is drawn. So nothing geometric here so far. This is a direct Now the caveat is Columbia and Falls will not have period maps to semi image That's a very strong, so strong, so quality of the image is equivalent corrections. So string theory, from a string theory or mirror symmetry point of view, this is a very boring case. It's still a nice result, uh, proved by Leo and Ian in 2014, that this Hodge theoretic condition can be translated um, into this, this period map involves no quantum correction. So that will be familiar to people working in Morse. So let me just give one example um, and then conclude. So here is an example. And in fact, as I understand, this is one of the very few that Um, and I think we've lost your sound, uh, Balash. It back. 
Not Six. yet. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yeah, I think now we're, now I can hear you, I think. Uh, can I continue? I... Um, yeah, I mean, I think I just, I just about heard you there. So maybe uh, try. You turn off the video, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe. After? Not really. Sorry. I know. Okay. Have you turned off your video now? Yeah. Do you want to try? Yes. So, um, okay. it's just explaining a very particular construction of a family of Calabria three folds here. Has that gone through? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we take a union of hyperplanes, so a very degenerate sextic in P3, um, and the triple cover branched along this union of sextics. That's a singular variety, and we take a small resolution. Um, so we get a Calabi L3 fold with uh, B3 R8. So it's a three dimensional moduli space, and all deformations of these Calabi Ls are described by this construction. So you can't deform away from this triple cover of uh, hyperplanes and then small resolution. So here's how you, uh, you construct the moduli space. So uh, let's take a, um, a Z lattice of signature three comma one. Um, and let's look at this, uh, what is effectively a complex unit three ball. So um, vectors in the projectivization of this lattice with, which come from uh, vectors of negative norm. Of some color folds and here is a, um, three ball and with a group action. And then a, a recent very pretty result of, of uh, Sheng and Zhu um, uh, is that the period map for this family factors in the following way. So first there is an, um, an open embedding. So this is a three dimensional moduli space and it openly embeds if it's effectively isomorphic to this ball quotient uh, and that then in turn embeds into the period domain. And this is one of these, um, the, the second embedding is one of these semi-algebraic closed embeddings that we saw on the previous slide. So once again, the moduli space is effectively a ball quotient that ball quotient embeds as a semi-algebraic subvariety of the period domain. And in particular, of course, this says that the, the composite period map is, is an inclusion, it's an embedding. So global Torelli hoards all this family. Now the caveat here is that this is really a very, very special example. And there are some related examples which, which are similarly, which work in a similar way, but again, that are quite special because really this, this three-dimensional host structure is not really three-dimensional. It's built up from one-dimensional host structures. In this particular case, there's a related construction which takes a triple cover of P1 uh, branched over six points. Um, that's a certain um, curve and you use that uh, compact curve to build the host structure of this, um, of this three manifold, of this uh, Calabria threefold. So this is very special, but I think also the result is, is very beautiful. So let me just uh, sort of draw conclusions. So uh, what have you learned about uh, the global moduli theory of Calabi and Fold? So locally, it's, it's very pleasant and well described by periods. There's a reasonable global algebraic theory of the moduli space. So this, this space M, it's quasi projective. Now, I didn't talk about mirror symmetry at all really, but mirror symmetry predictions of course come from a precise form of periods on this global moduli space plus monodromy data. Of course, typically the, the moduli space will be one dimensional, two dimensional, uh, or you take slices, but that's kind of the general context where mirror symmetry will take its predictions on, on the so-called B side and then translate that perhaps into curve counting. Now, the image of the period map globally is a, is a horizontal submanifold of the period domain, and that's usually a transcendental condition. So this is not really great to describe the moduli theory. Just wanted to mention one point on the mirror side. There is a kind of similar mirror problem and which is that how does the stringy Kähler moduli space sit inside the space of bridge and stability conditions? So this, this problem is in a quite precise form, the mirror of was the image of the period map. And I, I don't know in this language what's the strongest result, but on the bridge and stability side, there are some you know, very interesting recent works in particular due to Tom, which puts geometric structures on space of stability conditions and, and perhaps get some new results on, on how the stringy Kähler moduli space sits in there. Um, and perhaps one could sort of study that subject and see if we can say anything new back in, in uh, period land. But the period map can 
sometimes be used to describe the global moduli space, but these are very algebraic examples. So um, the horse, horse structure is, is very algebraic. Um, the period map is, is kind of very algebraic. Uh, almost, it's almost the fact that the case that if you know a global Torelli that you'll know at the, the very last minute and you knew the moduli space already before. So it's perhaps not so useful. Um, but there is still some interesting mileage, I think, to be get, gotten uh, from, from such examples. And of course, you know, the big embarrassing question is that we can't answer is, you know, how, well, how many families of, say, Calabria threefolds or Calabria and folds are there, which is completely unsolved. So uh, just for the, uh, for the website, there's a bunch of references, but um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, are there um, questions or um, further questions for Darsh? You all had a long week. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe I just going back to almost the beginning about the unobstructedness. Um, some, 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 some of the algebraic formulations of that allow you to say the same thing for some singular Calabias too. Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, that, that's right, and that's. Um, um, uh, that's very much, I mean, uh, the, the, the strongest results here are due to Namikawa and, and, and Mark Gross. And I haven't looked at the papers very recently, so I don't want to do this off the top of my head, but certainly there are very strong, precise conditions on when the moduli space is unobstructed. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, terminal singularities will behave differently from more general canonical singularities. So the most general class of singularities that might be natural here is, is canonical singularities. Um, and canonical singularities can certainly lead to obstructed deformation spaces. I think terminal, certainly in threefold, I think we know unobstructedness. But yes, so uh, papers from about sort of 15, 20 years ago by Mike Gross and, and, and Namikawa studied this very, very carefully. And yes, indeed, you, you, you can make stronger statements about singular, singular ones as well. That was very much also part of Mark's approach to this kind of uh, reach fantasy or connecting the web type of question. You degenerate, uh, or maybe you contract something in a Calabria threefold, you get some singular locus. Can you prove that the space there that you get has, uh, has unobstructed deformations? And then you can uniquely deform out into some smooth family. And that will give you a kind of unique way from going, going from one family to another family. Um, yes, yeah. so there's, there's a, a substantial literature on that. And indeed, what you're saying is true that there is some wider class of singularities for which, sorry, there's some singular, singular Calabria threefold certainly, but on, on obstructedness is true. I don't know what's, how much we know about higher dimensions that I expect to be harder and I don't know how well that question has been studied. Thanks. Uh, do you have some further questions? Um, I've got a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, in that last example um, that you discussed, where everything was algebraic, yeah. is that one of these examples where actually the Calabial is locally flat? It's, a, it's actually a quotient of a um, torus. No, it, uh, uh, no, I because don't those, think so. Those examples also have the same property, I think. Yes, that's right. A, yes, that's... This example that has three complex deformations. Yeah. That is uh, uh, order four quotient of um, a complex three torus. You're saying that's not that one. That's right. That's right. I don't think so. So what you're saying is correct. There's in fact a whole. There's a there's a kind of other examples. You can take quotients by of order four, eight, various numbers. There is a very nice, relatively recent paper of Rondon Agi and Sharp and maybe somebody else, um, which studies those examples. And indeed, often they have three-dimensional moduli space, 
and there the um, the host structure is kind of very obviously coming from uh, just a host structure of three elliptic curves essentially, which 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 you started with. Uh, this is different. So this is not quite so linear, and the host structure is that of a higher genus curve. So the motive is, is, is a bit more interesting. So the motive is not just that of an elliptic curve or a bunch of elliptic curves or some, some finite quotient of that. So I think this is, this is a sort of more subtle example in, in that sense. I, I didn't really want to use those examples that you mentioned for my talk because I thought that's, that, that's kind of like cheating because the whole structure yeah, is yeah, exactly. so obviously yeah. built in to be, to be essentially trivial. This is more subtle, I think. So, I mean, I don't know anything about the metric properties of these guys, but, but it, this is, so, this is not, not, not obvious to me. And I don't think these are even birational to, to torus quotients. I think they are, they are genuinely different. Um, and it might be interesting to find a few more examples which are like that. But, but at the same time, their period map is sort of triv trivial from the string. I mean, there's no quantum correction somehow. So this, this might, this might actually be interesting for you guys to study. I don't know what are the precise implications of, of this, but they lie strictly between the full complexity of three Calabiao and, and the quotients of the torus type examples. Mm -hmm. I think they may well be worth looking at, looking at this example. It's, it's very recent, it's, it's on the art. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Claude, do you have a question? Yes, I was just curious. So you, in the, this last example, uh, it actually is a, a smooth Calabi Yao. The other, uh, the other phenomena is related to having or, an orbifold. I think. How, how many, uh, how many uh, small resolutions do you have to make to? to I presume you introduce a, a generator of B, of H two for each uh, small resolution. Yeah. So okay. So to be honest, <laughs> notice I didn't even put a number. I don't know. So I looked at these papers this week. Um, I didn't know about this example. I found this example as I was preparing for this talk, and they uh, they refer to another of their paper uh, where they prove that there is a small resolution. And in fact, there are several, so there will be potential flops as well. I couldn't find. I, I'm, I'm slightly struggling with that, to be honest. I don't know how many how many blowups they ne you need to make. I don't know. So they claim in their result that there's a small resolution, and I believe it. I mean, it's not you know this fits, and in fact, they then find a, a birational map to another family of examples which was studied earlier. But again, I couldn't find a better number there either. So I, I'm afraid I couldn't get this out of the literature. Uh, and I think it requires a little bit of work to understand exactly how these are constructed. But, but to your other point though, I mean, one very often constructs, I mean, all my families were ultimately smooth families of Calabia threefolds in the previous examples as well. And that's kind of important that that ultimately you want to be talking about a family of smooth Calabi R3 folds. Well, or maybe not, but, but, but you often do. So in all the other examples as well, they were ultimately families of smooth Calabi R3 folds, but, but they often come, it's much easier somehow to construct uh, singular Calabi R3 folds with small Picar number and then resolve rather than mm -hmm. going for, 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 for the non-singular one. So, so this is a very general feature of the subject that you, you construct a family of singular ones and you resolve, and then you describe that topology, moduli space, and, and 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 so on. So that was that was the case with the, with the guys before as well. That those, the ones I was talking about, are genuinely had a one-dimensional complex moduli space of non-singular Calabi R three folds with H two one equals one. What often happens is that the resolution is not going to be unique. So the whole family comes in different versions. You have a whole family of flops, and you say I'm talking about this one or that one. So sometimes it's a canonical resolution, and sometimes not. But but it is a genuine family of smooth cardiac three folds that one's talking about. Okay, I, I, I like to encourage further informal discussion, but perhaps we'll uh, end the formal part here and uh, stop the recording and the YouTube broadcast and uh, thank uh, Balash again for his uh, for his talk. Thank you.